everyone. Welcome to um, ITS 450. Please, if you can, uh, mute your microphones. A little bit of static in the background. Uh, so let's uh, get started today. Uh, just a few reminders. Um, you, you should be seeing the calendar currently, course website and calendar. And I just want to show you uh, where we are. So that last week we covered the box testing model and did your security. And then you were working on your SQL injection lab. So that lab should be due November 5th, I believe. So make sure you submit that. Today is November 3rd, as you know, and we are going to look at JavaScript injections, and that's going to lead up to the cross-site scripting lab, right, which is a bit of a long one. <clears throat> so we're going to start it this week, but then we're going to work on it also on November 12th, right? And then um, that also, as you can see here in the... <clears throat> in the On here, you can see that uh, we have exam two on November 10th. Okay, so that's a week from today. We have our written, a second written exam. So make sure you study for that. The exam is going to be comprehensive. You know, everything that we covered since the beginning of the semester until pretty much cross site scripting, uh, the, the format will be very similar to what, you, you, what we've done before. All right, and so that's it. So just some a few reminders. Also, the project, I remind you, we're very, getting close to the end of the semester. So make sure you're working on that term project. If you have any uh, questions, let me know. Um, so, and then after that, if you notice, we really just have one more lab left, a cross-site request forgery, and then wrapping up the semester. Loose topics, miscellaneous topics. But really, you just, the good news is you really just have two more labs to go. Cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery that are going to be due. If we do another one, I might just do it for bonus points for those of you that would like to have some bonus points. But pretty much these two labs are left, the exam and then the project, okay? Uh, so that is that for today. So today I'm going to do a lecture pretty much. Um, and, and gonna, I'm going to talk about the cross-site scripting, JavaScript injections. Is, you should, I think you'll find this topic very interesting. Just like the SQL injection lab, this lab is also really great. I mean, it's a really interesting lab. And we're, you're going you're gonna to get to do a lot of very interesting things. And the great thing about it is it also ties in really well to your firm project. <clears throat> so... Now I'm going to share the Brightspace. Hopefully that's what you're seeing now. So if you notice in the Brightspace, I am currently here in cross-site scripting. You can click on that. And basically here, there's the uh, PDF or the link to the latest uh, lab and also the PowerPoint presentation. So I have some slides today that I'm going to be covering. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start those up here. All right, and I probably need to share again. Yeah. All right, so sh you should now be seeing my slides. Okay. So, um, as you might imagine, as part of software assurance, <clears throat> this is very similar to everything else we've done before. So at this point, we've done uh, code injections mainly. Code injections and then input validation, as you know. Usually the solution to everything is input validation. This is no exception, of course. Uh, so this input validation is not at all 
you know, an ex, you know, input validation is basically always the solution, right? We've done, uh, you know, in C, C++, buffer overflows. We've done buffer overflows. Then we've done um, other types of injections, right? Um, you know, PHP injections. And then we've done, you know, SQL type injections. <clears throat> and now we're going to do JavaScript injections. So right now, this is where we're going to really need, uh, you know, a good foundation in JavaScript. And you guys have that foundation because you've taken 110 and um, 362, done jQuery and all that. And so, you know, we've covered these and this is the one that we're going to cover today. And also CSRF is also another type. Oh, so I should say probably that within this, we're going to do two labs. There's the cross-site scripting XSS. You know, because cross-site scripting is actually CSS and CSS is associated with something else, the name, the abbreviation is actually XSS. And then CSRF will be the, the next lab. But this week we're focusing on this one. All right, and we're going to look at a lot of elements. But the key thing is, it's JavaScript. So it's going to be very similar, right? So instead of injecting SQL, for instance, into text boxes, now we're going to inject JavaScript into text boxes. So once again, the input is going to be the text box. So that's our input right there. Uh, and so the, the thing is, though, now we have to know how to inject JavaScript, JavaScript, right? Uh, and you guys know JavaScript is what? You have basically tags, right, in HTML now. So now the language has to do with, you know, the tags, right, the tags that we have associated, and then the JavaScript code that goes in here. Another thing that we're going to be needing for this lab will be the um, we're going to need the um, we're going to need the, um, an understanding or, or rem a reminder of DOM. So what is DOM again in the context of HTML and JavaScript? We just saw this in the WebSoft lab and lecture, right? What was DOM? Document object model. Very good, the document object model. So remember that I said that the DOM has basically everything about the page, the HTML page, including the objects, including, for instance, the cookie, right? So one of the things that we're going to, and remember that the cookie is, a, is something valuable. You know, traditionally, it's where the session ID is saved whenever you're logged in and authenticated, right? And so we're going to explore scenarios that will allow us to, for instance, try to steal the cookie, but this time around, we're gonna try to steal it via JavaScript and code injections. It should be a very interesting, very fun lab, I think. Um, should be very nice. So today I'm just gonna go over the basic logic of this. You know, obviously I'm not gonna teach JavaScript or DOM. Those are two concepts that you should know already. You know, we're dealing with websites, that too. And so, um, you know, because this is web security. All right, so basically this, this, the next set of slides will help us to have a better understanding of attacks and protection mechanisms, but I already laid it out there. And in particular, I put it in the context of a class, right? So the class has been uh, pretty much um, very consistent. You know, you've got some attack, which is a type of code injection. Now our code injection is going to be JavaScript based 
And then the, the, the defense is always, you know, input validation, something straightforward like that. All right, excellent. So let's keep going then. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and so I'm gonna move over here. So what is cross-site scripting? Let's start, you know, given that you already know the, the basic scenario or pipeline that I just discussed, now the question is, what is cross-site scripting or as I said, XSS? All right, so cross-site scripting is the ability at a website play user supplied content lays with HTML and JavaScript. So that's gonna be your text boxes, your text areas, etc. So imagine all these sites like Facebook, you know, you guys use Facebook, I'm sure, or you use Instagram, or you use, you know, all these different, um, you, I use YouTube for these videos, obviously, and every time I go on YouTube and I create one of these videos, I have to put in a little description, right? Well, that text box that Google gives me or, or YouTube gives me, you know, I type in things in there, the description of the video. Well, that's, that's the, the danger for YouTube, right? So YouTube, right? You know, they need, uh, I provide basically a description of, of the video. You know, I'll, I'll just say something like, okay, this is ITS 450, you know, cross-site scripting, right? That, that'll probably be <clears throat> the, the, the topic. I have to type that in. But what if I also, as I type that in, I wrote something like, what's that there? Do you see that that's JavaScript, guys? It's an alert, right? Remember the alerts in JavaScript? What do the alerts in JavaScript do? They make a pop-up box, don't they? they make a pop-up box, very good. And as it turns out, if you don't have any defense mechanisms, when you type some text into a text box, remember that that text then could be displayed on the page, right? So whenever you go to YouTube, right, and you do the video and the video loads on your browser at home, the description that I wrote, you know, ITS 450, you know, cross-site scripting lab, that description also downloads to your browser. But what if when I type that description, I also have typed this? What is that equivalent to? Well, that's equivalent to the HTML page having a JavaScript segment in there. And so what is the browser going to do if it sees a JavaScript segment? it's going to do what? It's going to try to run it, right? It's gonna, it's gonna treat it as any JavaScript on the HTML page because that's, that's how it works. You put JavaScript embedded in HTML, you see that? So if I wrote the, in, in the YouTube text, text area or text box, if I wrote the description of the lab, but also you know, a JavaScript and, and, and YouTube doesn't do anything, then what's gonna happen is all the time, you're gonna get a pop-up that says hello whenever you visit that website. You see that, guys? And obviously that leads to unexpected behavior, which is not something that you want or is, ex or is desirable. Um, and, but, you know, in this case, this simply is not very, this is benign, right? So it's not really like a very uh, dangerous thing. However, though, you know that JavaScript is a very powerful language, so you can, in fact, create much more complex uh, injections. And that there is the problem, okay? That there is the problem. 
Now that's what this, this week's and, and next Thursday's topic is gonna be about is basically that, that exact scenario. You always have a text area or a text box. It hasn't been properly validated. And you know, the in, you know, it doesn't have any input validation or security mechanism. And so students will be, or people would be able to write some text, but also write things like this. And in particular, they can write much more complex injections than this one. So that's kind of like in the buffer overflow attack, right? Where you did ever more uh, complicated code injections that just achieve more results. Here is sort of the same thing, except everything is running just on the client side in the browser, but that still could do a lot of damage. Imagine if you were logged into your bank, for instance, right? Um, now, we talked about same origin, web same origin policy. And web same origin policy applies to this. So I'm going to ask you at some point some questions about web same origin policy uh, to, to see if you, you, you get that. So uh, is this clear for everyone? Yes. Okay, great. Glad to hear it. All right, so then, so that's the, the overall idea, okay, the overall idea. All right, so um, web browsers, as you know, can execute commands. It's embedded in, H, in the HTML page itself, in your project. This is embedded all over the place, right? You, you want to have JavaScript. I mean, it does all the input validation. In 362, you, you should have used jQuery and you saw all the amazing things you can do with jQuery. So you need it. But the problem is here we're exploring the, the vulnerability of it. So what is this idea of cross-site? Basically, it means that foreign script, in this case, JavaScript, is sent via the server to the client. That's really the idea. Uh, the attacker makes web server delivery, the, sorry, the attacker makes web, the web server deliver malicious script code, as I just explained. And then the malicious script is then executed in the client's web browser. Okay. That's why a lot of people sometimes want to block. So if you've ever thought about why are they saying enable JavaScript or disable it? It's because of these types of attacks, right? These types of attacks. Obviously, if JavaScript is just disabled, they can't happen. But at the same time, then you don't have all the great things that JavaScript provides for you. So what are the types of attacks with this? You know, well, a lot, a lot can happen actually. You know, it, uh, it can access credentials. Now, as, as I said, if you remember, web same origin policy played a role in protecting your resources. Um, all of your, your browser uses uh, same origin policy to protect your resources. But you have to think about whether same origin policy can prevent cross-site scripting. So that's something that I want you to start asking yourself that question as we go through the slides, right? Does it protect against it? Um, you can also cause denial of service attacks with a cross-site scripting. For instance, you know, the example of you inject you inject some JavaScript code, and in the JavaScript code, you have a JavaScript, which is a for loop, for I, or, or, or actually while true. You know, alert. What is that gonna do if you write this code properly? You're gonna have an infinite loop, right, of alerts. When you have that, that's a denial of service because you've rendered your browser ineffective. Remember, 
in the context of the term project, I am going to, you know, you're creating a login from scratch and you're creating your own module from scratch, right? Just a few text boxes, but you're going to have that in there. I will intentionally, uh, I have asked you intentionally um, to create those from scratch. Also, I, it's possible that there's a text box in your project that is not properly validated. And what I could ask you to do is something like this. I could try to insert this in one of those text boxes and see if I can create an infinite loop or, or something, an alert. So you have to validate your code for this kind of thing, okay? So you have to be aware of it. This could also modify web pages, execute any command at the client machine, and so on, right? So there's a lot of things that can happen with this type of an attack, so just be aware of it, okay? Are there any questions so far? No? All right. Okay, so now here I have a really nice diagram of the XSS attack, right? So it involves three parties, the attacker, the web server, and the client. So the way that you should think about it is sort of like this. So Facebook, obviously, and, and you know, those companies, they, they've locked this down really well. But, but let's imagine Facebook, right? So this is Facebook. And this is, you know, their server some, somewhere out in California, let's say. I don't know where they are, but let's say somewhere out in California. You're the client, so you're in, you know, PNW, right? And there's some attacker, I don't know, somewhere. So the attacker, what does the attacker do? So uh, let's say that there is, uh, uh, you know, the, the Facebook posting, there's a group in there, a topic right and you know did you know that you know it's a question and answering error message on start i found a solution can anyone help you know all, a lot of communication is happening like a message board right on facebook or i don't know what you call it on facebook but uh, let's say the the timeline or whatever wherever you're posting things so what the attacker wants to do is they know that you as the client like to visit that bulletin board or that message board. You really like you know, the content there or the information and, and you actually post there. So you're gonna go there every now and then. So then the, what the attacker is gonna do is they're going to look at that message board. They're gonna open up a text area or text window where they're, they're going to type things. So the attacker then is going to type things. But in that same place, they're going to inject JavaScript code, okay? So they're gonna inject JavaScript code, and I don't know, something, some, some very complex JavaScript code. It could be a lot of code, it could be, you know what else it could be? It can simply be a URL. That's it, it could literally be just a URL, but that URL then calls another file, and then that file gets executed, and can have a lot of code, and so you have a, a real issue there. Uh, we'll, we'll see that in the lab, actually, how, how that can be done. But let's just imagine for now, it's just direct JavaScript. I'm just going to write JavaScript in here. So then the attacker is going to write that in, in the message itself, right? That's written in. So what happens now? What happens now is the attacker has done that, and now comes the client. And the client reads this. And immediately they check the message. And when they check that message, the JavaScript runs on, remember it runs on the client side because it's JavaScript. But if it's a bad code, bad, bad things or whatever, it's going to run that JavaScript on their um, machine, right? And it could be very negative. It could be very negative code and it could cause, uh, problems. Does this make sense, guys? So that's the idea. All right, so now let's let's look at a let's look at 
the demo. So this actually is a little demo of how it works. It's actually pretty nice. All right, let's see. So first the attacker sends the malicious code. There it goes. So it's basically a forum message. They're gonna, they're gonna post something. Like for instant, instance, they're gonna say, get money for free. And then they put the script code in there. And then you can see the attack code is right there. These are the JavaScript tags. Okay, that's laid in there. Then the server stores that message in there. So now you can see it's stored in the, in the queue, right? And the attack code is hidden in there. You see that? Um, then the user requests a message. So then comes the client. They're gonna go to the, met, the bulletin board and they, they click on that message. And at that point, the message is delivered by the server. So the server sends it back to the client, but it also sends, because you know it sends the whole HTML, that's what happens. You know, uh, everything gets combined and an HTML file gets sent to the client. But then when they run it, the attack code is included and that's going to run in the client machine on the browser. And then the browser executes the script and then a code is delivered. And the question is, what is that code going to be? So that's, you know, that's the question you kind of have to think about, right? You know, and obviously there's a lot of things that we'll see we, we can do with this. All right. And this is only one example out of many attack scenarios that we will explore uh, in the lab. So who is affected by the cross-site scripting. So uh, obviously the client is, the, is first, right? So the, that's the most direct attack. XSS attacks, first target is the client because the client, first of all, trusts the server. If you go to Facebook, I mean, you, you religiously will go to it without ever worrying about that, but they, they must um, and, you know, make sure that they're, they're, they don't have that kind of vulnerability. All right. All right. Um, the browser executes the malicious code. A second target of this is, of course, uh, the company running the server, right? Because let's say that you guys went to Facebook and that happened to you, that you got that cross-site scripting you wouldn't be so comfortable going to Facebook anymore, right? That, that's what would happen. So the, indirectly, this also affects the company uh, that has this kind of problem because they have a loss of public image, customer trust, money, et cetera. So certainly they, you know, they, they're pretty good about this. Um, so the impact is that the XSS attack can access your authentication credentials. In particular, they can, pretend to be you, okay? They can pretend to be you. Uh, and they can try to steal your username, password, your cookies. Um, you know, they can target your personal data, credit card, bank account, or in the business, the, you know, information about the business, or actually impersonate you, right? They can pretend to be you. So those are all things that, uh, we will think about in this topic. So, but you might say, how can um, XSS get my, steal the cookies, right? So you're saying I, you know, it's I can access to cookies, but, but then you might, you might ask this question, how is it possible that you have a browser, right? And you down from the server, you downloaded the JavaScript code, the malicious code. So now let's say, uh, it's here, right? You downloaded the, you know, the, the JavaScript, right? You downloaded it and it's the bad code. And then this code is going to try to access the cookie, for instance, and steal it somehow. But then you might ask yourself, but wait a minute, you said that web same origin policy does not allow uh, 
does not allow JavaScript to steal cookies, right? That, so then how is this possible? How is it possible that you said that on one side, WebSoft stops it, but then you're saying here that it can happen with a cross-site scripting. So what do you guys think? Do you think that WebSoft could stop it or yes or no? And, and based on your answer, why? What's, what's the reasoning? Any ideas? You can just try to guess. So what did we say? So let's start with this. What did we say about web same origin policy? What is it? What was it again? Right, in, in, in the previous lab, you had some JavaScript, remember, and the JavaScript was trying to, to read things about a document, or you had one, I believe, also that you pressed a button and it would show the cookie. So that, that was the idea that the JavaScript, that when you hit the cookie, some JavaScript would execute, would try to access the cookie. But then we saw that sometimes we would get allowed and we'd see the results, and sometimes we would get restricted by same origin policy. So what's going on here? Why is it, can, can web same origin policy stop a JavaScript injection? Like a, in particular, cross-site scripting attack, yes or no, and why? Is it, it, uh, it can't because Technically, the JavaScript's on, like it's, it's from that website with the same port, the same URL. So when it not stop it. So let's see what he's saying. Now, here is the website, right? You know, a message board somewhere on the server. It's got some text boxes, like add, you know, text area, you know, add some text to the website. The attacker is outside. This is the attacker. And basically the attacker injects some code into there and then that code like gets added to the page, right? It becomes part of it. So what, Joseph said then is what? What do you guys think? Is he correct or is he wrong? Joe, what did you say? Uh, that since the JavaScript is now part of the, like part of the website and the server, it's technically running from the server. It, yeah, ex exactly, right? That, so in web same origin policy, what we said is if we had two domains or things that didn't have the same origin, right? Which have to do with protocol, port number, and domain, right? If they were different, then this one could not access that one. But in this case, it's not that there's a second page that's trying to access this one, right? Instead, what do we have? we injected code in, into the text box so it became part of this, of the original file. You see that? And so he's right, exactly that. It, it technically becomes part of that same page. Do you see that? And then because of that, this is not happening. It's more like this is happening. We are injecting it in the page and it literally becomes embedded within the page so web same origin policy cannot stop this one. Is that, are there any questions about that? Is that clear? That's definitely an exam type question right there. Um, so I just want to know if that's clear for everyone. It's clear. That makes sense. Excellent. Great. Thank you. All right. So now then that's one of the more important concepts about this, right? So that we understand the mechanics of this. And then, you know, after that, it's just going to be a whole bunch of uh, the technicalities, just like with everything, right? The concept itself is pretty simple and straightforward. It's just crafting those code injections 
is really what takes a lot of uh, a lot of work. So the kinds of things that work we can have, you know, pop-up floodings, you know, crashing the browser, and that relates to quality. Remember, uh, which is also part of software assurance, uh, stealing information, and so on. So the solution to this, as with everything else we've done all semester, pretty much input validation. But what is to consider um, the, the input, right? So in this case, it would have to be meta characters, like those script tags, for instance, right? So script, you know, we got to do something about them because you know, that's the problem. So one of the things that you will do as part of your code auditing in this lab is usually the, the, the labs include uh, the solution and then they disable the solution. So you want to take a look at that. But usually it's some type of blocking of characters or escaping of characters. So how do our, yeah, so how to perform the input validation, basically check if the input is what you expect uh, or, you know, blacklisting, whitelisting, right? So only blacklist, uh, um, allow certain characters or block certain characters. So that's really what it comes down to. So usually having a list of allowed characters is probably better than blocking certain characters. Because there, you know, there could be a lot of combinations that attackers could crack, right? And so usually it's better just to have a list of allowed characters. All right, and then this just summarizes a lot of the ideas I've mentioned. So that's kind of the in the slides the gen general uh, discussion of uh, cross-site scripting. And now really what we're going to get into is the discussion of the attack itself. And then we're going to get into the lab and start reading through that one as well um, so that you can start working on it on Thursday. Remember this Thursday, you will start working on this lab because, you know, the SQL, by, by now the SQL injection lab should be um, completed. All right. So defenses against XSS. Um, another defense is actually firewalls and why, you know, why a network firewall? Because really, one of the things that will happen a lot, as you will see with uh, XSS, is that there's going to be a redirection. You know, whenever you have that, you know, some your the JavaScript will try to redirect you to some place to to do more things, steal files, um, or um, have you download further content, and so. A good solution to this is just to have a firewall. So for instance, if you don't do any business with Russia, you know, don't have links to servers in Russia, right? Or, or some other uh, place, Germany or whatever. So basically on your firewall, as you, as you guys might remember from your 372 class, we talked about geolocation, right? So you can always geolocate and, you know, block out certain traffic. So make sure all, all your traffic goes through this firewall. The firewall can be set up to block any calls to foreign sites to execute a script. Also, uh, for those of you, if you haven't taken 454 yet, we're going to look at uh, proxy firewalls, and those are also pretty good uh, for that kind of thing, which are just servers that your network traffic has to go through uh, sometimes. All right. Uh, and then the defenses, you know, regular expression frameworks, uh, limiting the number of characters, drop downs, et cetera, all kinds of input validation. Um, now, as far as the vulnerabilities, um, you know, as we've stated, the cross site scripting vulnerability allows the introduction of malicious content, which are basically scripts. Right and and you know from 372 and 110 you should know how incredibly powerful these are. The jQuery in particular is extremely powerful. Um, all right, so we've mentioned that. All right, so and then I've said all of this already. So. 
So it's, it's basically the, the concept is any way to fool the, a legitimate website, a server, basically Facebook to send malicious code to a user's browser. So usually it's going to arrive, as I said, you know, you open a bulletin board and then you start downloading the, it's, it's like, you know, I'm sure you guys use GitHub a lot. So if GitHub, GitHub didn't do this and people would post things on GitHub, but also, um, JavaScript code, then when you opened it on your browser, that code would be doing a lot of, a lot of bad things. Okay. Yeah. So usually it's going to be either in links, user error messages, comments, and so on. It's all kinds of things. The risks, theft of account credentials and services, impersonation is a big one. You can create a worm, you know, like a, like an, like an internet worm, it's very much like a computer virus, but a worm. And, and if you remember uh, from your previous classes, you probably define what that is. A worm is nothing more than code behavior. And so we're going to implement as part of this lab, uh, an internet worm in, in the, the kind that could uh, be present in a social media website. And it's going to propagate just like that with the whole idea of friends and, and all of that. So we're gonna actually replicate that, the SAMI worm um, in this one. But anyway, so theft of account credentials, impersonation, User tracking or stalking and statistics, um, which, which actually this is almost like what all the ad companies do. They're almost in a way uh, a cross-site scripting attack, literally. <laughs> so all these hundreds of uh, uh, personalized you know, ad clicks and whatever, and you know, they're almost the same thing because they're just embedded code. Whenever you download a page, you download them. And then they start doing their thing, right? And so it's, it's, they're kind of this, you know, in a sense, they are, you know, uh, uh, cross site scripting thing. All right. So you could get misinformation also now, now in the area, in the, in the era of fake news, right? And all of that. So you can get that um, denial of service. I've talked about that, which is, you know, like a for loop. Um, and exploitation of web, web browser, create phony user interface. So you know, kind of uh, phony user. Um, so that ties in a little bit to the worm because what the worm will do is it's called the SAMI worm. And I mean, you probably heard of it. Very famous some time ago. And, and we're just basically, you know, although now it's being, everything's patched for that, we're gonna try to replicate it. And you'll see that it's, it's not as hard as you would think it would be, but at the same time, obviously we have to code the JavaScript really well, but we'll see that. And it's gonna be a, what is called a self-replicating worm, which basically means that you have Bob and Alice and Zelda, right? And what's gonna happen is, you know, we would put the worm here and then Alice visits Bob's website, and then now the worm would propagate over here, but it's also a self-replicating worm so that Zelda never visited Bob. She only visited Alice, and guess what? When she visits Alice, now the worm is here. So in terms of exponential propagation, this is terrible because, you know, it goes like that, and then you know, these visit that one and then their friends over here and, you know, and so on, right? So hopefully that makes sense. So, so we're going to create that one self-replicating worm using cross-site scripting and you will see how, how that works. All right. Are there any questions or comments so far, guys? No? No. All right. Okay, great. So let's keep going then. Um, so the risks, as I said, you know, stolen account credentials, right? Uh, with XSS, it may be possible for your credentials to be stolen and used by the user. So the user is going to try to certainly impersonate you because as 
Joey said, you know, you have that JavaScript just became part of your own page. Think about it. It's like the attacker somehow was able to get your code and write code in your code. And so they have access to all your resources. They can actually use the cookie that you've established the session to your bank account and they can start issuing commands, right? To make transactions, et cetera. So it's, it's a pretty serious thing actually. So any website requiring an authentication, uh, authentication needs to, to use a tech, technological solution to prevent from continually asking user passwords, right? And you know that because you're implementing that in your project. So those credentials have a form of a session ID. So when you, when you think about a client server architecture, there's a session ID and a cookie stored in your computer that allow that is basically so that you don't have to authenticate every time because uh, browsers are stateless, right? And so you have to keep some way of, of having state. Okay, so that, you know, that gets added to the HTML every time. So cookies are commonly used to store credentials. Uh, these are usually accessible to the client side scripts, which is basically what's going to be happening um, there. Excuse me. Uh, we've talked about this, so I'm not going to, you, you can have denial of service attacks by making the browser unresponsive. Also, many redirects, you know, all kinds of things. All right. So let's take a look at this, an example. We have an example here because you guys will be writing some of these for your lab. All right. So let's imagine that you have some code like this. So let's take a second. This is code that looks a lot like your project, right? And, you know, like the code we've been exploring. So we have, you know, our HTML tags, HTML, HTML. We have the body tags over here. And then if you notice over here, we have um, PHP. You see that, that PHP, PHP is there. And it's going to have an echo. And remember that the echo in PHP just prints something out to the page. So it literally, the HTML now will have that string in there. And so that's a convenient place. And, and this is actually an input, right? This is an input. You're passing maybe a, a, a text box from the form as a get request. And so look at that's where the problem might happen, right? So here we can see, you know, the website is called LAP LAPD online, right? And then you have search results, search, and then view all one, change filter one, search type equal content basic, and then search terms. And it takes, this is probably your input, David Brumley. Notice that the, the user type David space Brumley, but th certain characters like spaces uh, get URL encoded. So space is equal to percentage 20. Okay, so that's the only thing about this that because it's, it lives in the web and web browsers and everything, we will have to use the URL encode. But basically here, search term might be this term here. And so it opens up the opportunity for an attacker to think, oh, okay, that's where I need to insert my code, okay? So you should note the URL contains our search parameters as part of the get, all right? So please, if you have any questions or anything is confusing, stop me at any time, all right? I don't wanna say, do you guys understand every time? So I assume you do. Otherwise, just ask questions. All right, so here the, the problem is though now, in this, uh, this, we know that it's gonna go into the code through there, and we know that the user, this is probably referencing some kind of text box, so this is where the attacker comes in. So the attacker now can replace that David Brumley with something else. So the first example, the easiest one that you should do in your lab assignment 
this week is just to insert an alert. So you're going to insert. This is basically, you know, standard JavaScript. Oops. So standard JavaScript. Right. And so you're going to just insert that in there. Right. So script. That one is just um, a pop up. So that's just a pop-up, that's it's an alert, you know, and it basically says test. So that one, pretty simple, but that the idea is that you could enter other within these script tags, right? Within these script tags, you can add all kinds of dangerous code. As you know, many websites take user input, you know, YouTube takes user input, Facebook takes user input, uh, in your bank, you usually in text boxes enter numbers. Whenever you log into any page, it takes text numbers. Um, Amazon allows you to write comments. You know, all of these have uh, ways to insert input. And then they display that input back on a new web page, right? So, for instance, Amazon, right? They have all these comments and those comments have a lot of very valuable information about those products being sold. Um, so they're being displayed back is, is what this means. So common examples are comments on blogs, ratings on you know, eBay or all of these searches. Google basically it's nothing more than one text box, right? Where you type in lots of things. So all of those scenarios, uh, you could try to insert code, right? And so they have to be properly validated for that. Yeah, they, they can even have their own custom code that, that handles that somehow. So, you know, it, it certainly, hopefully you can see with, that's why with this lab, you're going to see with a simple, basic website, PHP, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, you'll be able to replicate these if they don't have any, any defenses enabled, okay? All right, so let's look at or continue to think about that example of La LAPD online. So now the idea was, if you remember before, they took David Brumley here in the search term, and that was going to be passed on to um, here to the PHP or somewhere in the code, right? That so so now uh, you're going to be taking user input and displaying it without filtering, and that is a cross-site script. Right, so if you don't filter it or, or input validate it, you're going to have a problem. So here, for instance, the basic idea, I get someone to click on a link containing code that will then execute on their browser. So here, for instance, I have LAPD online, search results, search, view all, filter, search type, and then and search term. And instead of having David Brumley here, notice it's this one, right? Script. Script, script, and then the alert. That's the code that they're injecting. That basically gives you a, a pop-up, a denial, a type of, you know, some unexpected behavior. But just notice that the one, the one necessity is that because it's happening, you know, this is a GET request, so the URL, URL. The only thing is that some symbols have to be URL encoded. So you can see here, for instance, percentage 3C is what? It is the symbol like this, okay? So you will have to do this um, in your lab, and that's just basically, you know, the syntax of the attack. Then notice, um, Script is the word, so that's fine. Then this symbol is going to be uh, percentage 3E will be that symbol, right? Then we have the alert that works fine. The parentheses works fine. But then the double quotes, 
right? That's going to be percentage 22. Then test is there, the double quotes again, semicolon, then again, this symbol, right? This symbol, that's just percentage 3C again. Uh, and then the final one, percentage 3E, which is for this symbol over here. You see that? So basically, that's the only thing, you know, as with every language, they, it has its specifics. But all we're doing is we're inserting that alert. Obviously, in our first lab, we can do, we will do an alert in our first problem of our lab. But obviously, uh, they're going to get more complex until we get to the self propagating worm. I don't hear any questions, so I'm just going to continue. So, so some people might say, but then, okay, why, why allow XSS? Uh, why allow people to, in, 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 you know, why don't you just restrict them? Don't let them type anything beyond some characters. Well, the problem is people want to write some characters. Sometimes, you know, they might even, by having uh, an editor, they can format things a little bit better. So some, many websites allow you to use safe HTML and feedback, right? And usually they'll, they'll have an editor though. And, and, and so you have to kind of do it to that, okay? But um, being a, some websites is particularly in the past, I would say, you know, they would let you type text with HTML, some HTML. I think that has changed a lot now and they can use editors instead. All right. All right, let's look at another example, example number two. All right, so So what, what, so given the discussion that I've given so far, take a look at this script. Let's take a look at it for a couple of minutes. Who can tell me what's going on here? Who can describe basically the whole process? It's right there, but uh, if somebody wants to volunteer, just go ahead and describe what's going on here. Hello, is this working? Yes, I can hear you. Um, so the user sees the link, they uh, interact with the link, and it, um, it redirects them to uh, the malicious site, and on that, the script is executed, and the, oh. um, a malicious cookie was returned to the user. Uh, malicious, define that, what you just said. Uh, muy no bueno. <laughs> no, so I think you said it backwards is what I meant. Oh, to say. So, oh I'm sorry. So the cookie is not being downloaded. The cookie is actually being sent to the attacker. So it's like they're stealing it. Do you see that? Uh, yes. Because what's happening is, you know, if you think about, um, this is dome. So the document object model, right? What, what is covered in 110 and 362. So basically, yeah, as you said, consider the link. You have a URL here, victim.com search PHP, and then you have term equal. So that's your opportunity for your text box or whatever. But then you have in here a script, right? Somebody injected that script in there. And so now when you click on this, it's like that script will run on your machine, right? Because JavaScript runs on the client side. So it runs on your browser. And what's happening here is that now you have some commands in DOM that will run on your browser and do things. And there's a lot of ways of doing this, but this is one where you say window.open and then what do we open to? Notice there's a new URL 
badguy.com. So it's dif different from victim.com. And then as a URL, as a parameter, you pass cookie equal, and then guess what? Document.cookie. But whose document? Your document, your, the, your client side document, right? Some dome, and then from there, your own cookie. Remember, same origin policy does not stop this because it thinks that this script is part of the same domain, right? So that's the problem. So the browser goes to, vic the, the user goes, you know, the, the user's browser, I should say, goes to victim.com search. Victim.com, the server sends back the whole HTML with that malicious script, right? This malicious script is in there. And so the browser now ends up executing this malicious script over here. And that malicious script sends to badguy.com, some other server. And guess what? You're actually sending that client's or that user's cookie. And that's the problem. Usually though, that will just be to illustrate how it works. We're gonna do a problem like that in the lab. Really what you wanna do though, what the bad guy wants to do is, is even more advanced than that. It, they don't want the cookie at their server. What they want is they're gonna take the cookie, but they're gonna use it in this JavaScript and basically issue a command pretending to be you. Like if you had, let's say you're logged into your bank you click on this, this gets inserted into your, your bank for some reason, then you run, it, you run it from your bank and that JavaScript will issue the commands to transfer money to some, to some account. And how is it gonna authenticate? It's gonna, because you're logged in, it's gonna use your own cookie to say that, you know, that, that it was you. Now, obviously the, this type of a, an attack requires you to be logged in. That's one key thing. So if you just go to the page and let's say that the message board shows the message there, but you're not logged in, they're not going to be able to, even if it runs, it's not going to be able to pretend to be you because you're not logged in. You don't have a cookie, et cetera. So, but if you were logged in, then it can pretend to be you. Okay. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. So the solution for this is sanitizing, obviously. Um, so checking for script tags. So, you know, these kinds of uh, tags. So everyone's gonna have their own um, approach to this, but, you know, you can take a look at the lab and how, how this is implemented there, okay? Problems with filters, obviously, we, we've looked at this problem before um, that, you know, what kind, of, what kind of keywords you're going to have. So if, for instance, uh, you block, let's say that you look for, let's say that you look for, you know, um, look for this right that's you're always that's one of your bad characters or bad sequence of characters so then the attacker might say okay they're gonna look for that or they're gonna look for that so you do a pass you didn't find that but you find this one so it's gonna be from here to, to there that gets blocked out and filtered out but then the attacker still ends up with, um, still ends up with something that they can use basically. So, oh, actually, sorry. What, what I meant to say is this is the bad. Which one? Yeah, that one, right? So. So maybe that you're looking for that one word, okay? But then the problem is you filter out that word, you delete it basically, and now you still end up with script source. And so filtering does have its disadvantage. 
Okay, so later on, we're gonna take a look at some of the countermeasures for this. So just straight up filtering like this is not always the best thing, okay? Um, but yeah, so those, those, that's basically an illustration of problems with filters. Just have you know, a whole bunch of if statements to filter out content. All right, so now that takes us to uh, Sammy. And that's how it's spelled, I guess. So we are going to, uh, you know, replicate the Sammy worm. Okay, the Sammy worm. Very fun, I think. Very, you know, very. It's very. It's actually pretty easy to implement, surprisingly. Uh, and so we are going to implement that just for illustration purposes, so that we get an understanding both of of, of cross site scripting, but also of a computer worm. You see that there, computer worm. Um, and this was something that happened in MySpace.com some time ago. You know, the predecessors of Facebook and all that. Um, and so, you know, obviously they they've uh, added defenses for this now. But the idea is that users can, you know, in, in MySpace, people could users could post HTML on their pages. MySpace.com uh, ensured that HTML contains no, none of these characters, right? None of those symbols. But you can do JavaScript within CSS tags, for instance, and you could hide code there. So apparently this is how they, uh, they got it in there. And so, the, so we're not going to worry about that. We're just going to make it easy and just assume we have a text box or text area because we really just want to worry and understand how, how it works. Uh, so <clears throat> with careful JavaScript hacking, the, Sammy's, the Sammy worm can be implemented. And the goal will be, and I think I already described this already, that basically it infects anyone who visits an infected MySpace page. It's going to add Sammy as a friend. So that means that it's going to pretend to be you. And actually it's like you press the button. You know how when you go to Facebook and you see somebody and you're like, oh yeah, I'm going to click on this person and I'm going to request a friend, right? And so that's the same idea, except that you're going to automatically become friends with everyone with Sammy. So everyone's going to become friends with Sammy. If they visit your page, then Sammy becomes your friend. And then if others visit you, Sammy becomes their friend and so on and so forth. And it's never ending. If you, if you look, if you want a statistic here, you can see that Sammy had millions of friends within 24 hours. Okay, now the key thing is we're only doing a worm that's not delivering any kind of payload. So we're not, you know, we're just basically, it's a self-replicating um, worm and it, it's going to friend everyone, but it's not actually going to have a payload that does something, you know, extremely bad. All right. Does this, uh, is this clear? Is Sammy clear? You guys understand the basic idea? Yeah. So what I need to do next is really discuss the code, right? So obviously I will go over the JavaScript code. I really like this lab. Um, so, so we'll go over the code and then you guys will implement it and, um, just, what do you call it? Um, run it basically on your, on your lab and, and, and see how it works. Other tricks that we're going to explore in the lab is, uh, how to send data. So it's actually, it's surprising how easy it can be. Um, so for instance, one very easy trick to send data from is to inject a JavaScript that has quite simply a image request, right? So it's like you have a URL from, for an image. So what happens when you have an IMG tag, IMG, and then what is it? Ref, I think, or source or something. And then it goes to some URL. Right? You guys know this, right? Whenever you get to an HTML website and you, and you have that in the HTML, what happens? 
you go to wherever this URL is and you try to retrieve an image, correct? Well, as it turns out, because you're using JavaScript, you can, you know, paste into this anything, including, for instance, the cookie. So literally, that server where you are looking for an image may not have an image. Maybe your goal is just to send the cookie over there or to send some information. You know, you know one thing that might be sent is just really a timestamp of you. So it might be that they're just waiting to know when you're logged in. Think about it. They just want to know the second you log in, boom, it sends that out and they know that you, hey, we just got the request for the image. That means they just logged into the page and then maybe they can do something bad as well. Right, and that's, you know, that's kind of a, another thing we'll explore in the lab as well. So we'll talk about what is a worm and how can we implement one, of course. Uh, that's going to be the problems uh, in the lab, the three point, you know, all the problems in the lab. All right, so that's the slides for today. So now we can go ahead uh, and look at the lab. All right, so we're going to go ahead and look at the lab. So I'm going to go back to Brightspace. I probably need to show this. All right, so here you should be seeing the Brightspace environment now. Uh, I'm going to click on the I'm going to click on this so I'm going to go to the seed labs should be seeing the seed labs and I'm going to click on seed labs here and this uh, lab should be under web security and it should be cross-site Thing. I'm going to click on it and then I'm going to open. So let's see, update notice. This lab description was newly updated on July 26, 2020. If this update happened in the middle of your assignment, you can always get the old version from here. The old version will phase out soon. Uh, VM version. This lab has been tested on our pre built. Okay, so this one works on 1604. That's really what I was looking for so that that's the VM we're using all right so this is then the updated version okay so that means because what's really important about this lab is that the website needs to be on the VM right so so let's take a quick peek at it Okay, there you can see an example of, so are you guys seeing this? Yeah, okay. So you should be seeing the PDF of the lab. So notice here what I've been, one of the things I've been discussing in the slides, right? There's the alert. So posting something to an alert. Um, so you can see that. Stealing cookies, right? And I, I talked about that, so we'll see how we can do that. The server that you know that's perfectly fine. This website, uh, you will need actually some. You might need some files. So just um, make sure as you're working on it that you download this zip file. Okay. So you're just going to have to install, according to this, the latest version of live HTTP headers. That's probably in the PDF, how to do that. Uh, and then also the corresponding chapter for this is chapter 11. So I strongly recommend that you take a read on that one. Here's the 1604 VM. All right, so let's go back to the PDF then. Um, so, you know, First few problems are just a warm up, and then you can see becoming a friend. So that's just, you know, friending someone. The code is there. And there's actually a lot of ways of writing this code, um, not just that one. 
modifying a victim profile with the excess as warm. And then basically writing the self propagating one, right? So you gotta, you gotta really do the, all the two previous ones before you get to the self propagating worm. But it should be a lot of fun to implement this. Dome, of course, a little bit of a description of dome over here. And I'll, 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 I'll uh, describe this code in a lot more detail on Thursday, not today, but uh, so don't worry about it. Today, what I want you to do is really to start reading through this PDF. You can see here Elk's countermeasures. And then defeating XSS attack using uh, CSP. Uh, and then, yeah, so we can take a look at that. And then, and then some guidelines on how to use live HTTP headers. So live HTTP headers is a little program. It used to be an add-on for Mozilla. And really what it does is that it allows you, whenever you make a get request or a post request on a website, it allows you to see the data. And that's going to be very important because that data that you'll be seeing, that usually when you click on something, you don't see it in the background, right? But the problem is you're going to need that data to paste it into your, or to, cr or to craft basically the URL that you're going to be sending directly from JavaScript, some of your JavaScript code. So, You'll be using uh, live HTTP headers quite a bit on, um, on this lab. And here it just shows kind of how to use it. So definitely you've got to read a lot, um, a lot of the details here. Remember with JavaScript, if you make one single little error, um, it doesn't show you what, what happened. All right. Uh, and there you go. So that's, this is the lab. Let's use this one. It's pretty much the same one, I think. They haven't really changed it that much. Um, so let's, so first of all, all right, before I get started, oh, ELG, uh, if you don't know what ELG is, ELG is a framework for developing social media sites. So it's like, if you want to develop a Facebook, instead of writing the whole code from scratch, ELG already has it developed, and then you can just, like, it, administratively through a page, you know, make changes to it. So that's what was meant by L. All right. So this is what we're going to do for the lab. So this week, as I said, you know, uh, we'll be discussing this in a lot of detail. Um, I haven't heard any questions about the SQL injection lab. So I assume you guys didn't have any problems with that one. Um, but now, remember, we're starting this one. So we're going to go kind of, I, I, uh, you know, step by step. So I guess uh, let's start with it. All right. So let's look at the overview of this lab. So cross-site scripting is a type of vulnerability commonly found in web applications. Uh, it makes it possible for attackers to inject malicious code, e.g. JavaScript code. That should be pretty obvious by now. And my pen doesn't work. Oh, oops, doesn't work. All right, so into the victim's web browser. Using this malicious code, attackers can steal victim credentials such as session cookies. Uh, the access control policies of same origin policy employed by the browser to protect those credentials can be bypassed by exploding by exploiting these vulnerabilities. So we've already addressed why that is. Uh, to demonstrate what attackers can do by exploiting XSS vulnerabilities, here we have a web application named ELG in the VM. ELG is a very popular open source web application for social network, and it has, and it has implemented a number of countermeasures to remedy the XSS threat. To demonstrate how XSS attacks work, uh, those have been commented out, or we have come, or they have commented out these countermeasures in ELG in the installation. 
So that makes Elk vulnerable. So one of the things as part of your code auditing is that you're going to explore and figure out what those countermeasures are, right? What they look like. So you can just provide screenshots of them. Uh, without the countermeasures, users can post any arbitrary message, including JavaScript programs to user profiles, which obviously is not a good thing for obvious reasons that we've discussed so far. Um, in this lab, students need to exploit this vulnerability to launch an XSS attack on the social media side uh, in a way that is similar to, so ultimately what we want to achieve in the last problem is what Sammy uh, Kamkar did to MySpace in 2005. All right, so through the so-called notorious Sammy Worm. <laughs> Uh, the ultimate goal of this attack is to spread an XSS worm among the users such that whoever views an infected user profile will be infected. And whoever is infected will add you, the attacker, to his or her friend list. And that's called a self-replicating worm. Uh, this lab covers topics such as cross-site scripting attack, XSS worm and self-propagation, session cookies, which you guys should know because you're creating a Login, uh, HTTP GET and POST requests, also something that you should know from 362, JavaScript. Ajax, I know you guys may not have taken the 462 class yet, but that's fine. I mean, it's, it's, it's very um, similar, so don't worry about that one. And then the so-called content security policy that can help us with this, all right? Uh, so the task seven countermeasures is redesigned and it's now based on content security policy. So, um, and then the, the readings for this uh, detailed coverage of cross-site scripting can also be found in your book, right, in chapter 10. Or you just find the cross-site scripting chapter of the book and you can just read along. That should be pretty good. Of course, we're using the 1604 VM is the one we've been using uh, all semester. Uh, so there you don't really have to do anything. The, the, the website is already there. The important thing is that the social media site has some user accounts, admin, Alice, Bobby, Charlie, and Sammy. And they have, the, you got the passwords there and you got the actual username. All right. And then as far as the, you don't have to do anything with configuration, you just need to, to know, you're going to have to read the files, obviously. So they're located in var ww xssl. And then the URL to find the social media site, excuse me, is going to be in on here. So you'll be able to access that, access that from the VM. It's already been configured. Remember, this type of configuration is probably is one of the things you need to do for your project, right? So all these labs have this uh, setup, and you need to replicate that. Okay, you can see that there. Okay. Um, all right. So now that we've discussed that, the lab environment. We are ready to start the discussion of the lab task. So for this lab, you'll be responsible for all problems, right? I definitely uh, strongly recommend that you run through this sequentially. So you will start with 3.1, 3.2. All right, so the first one, 3.1, it's basically just, it's called literally getting familiar with live HTTP headers, or I guess HTTP header live now. Uh, that's really the tool that tells you Whenever, so what happens is you turn on live HTTP header and then you have your, your, your the social media site. Whenever you, you want to see something, you clear it, right? you're going to clear all the information out. Then you're going to go and maybe you put some data in a text box. When you press that button, that message, that request, either a get request or a post request is created. And it's going to execute, but it will also appear in live HTTP headers. So 
what you want is you want to have that information there so that you can copy paste it into your own JavaScript code injections. Okay. That's really the idea. Does that make sense? So in this lab, you need to construct HTTP requests, right? So as, as, as it's stated here, you will need to construct an HTTP request to figure out what an acceptable HTTP request in ELG looks like, okay? We, you need to be able to capture and analyze HTTP requests and we can use a Firefox add-on called HTTP, HTTP header live. So before you start working on this lab, you should get familiar with this tool. Instructions on how to use this tool are given in the guidelines section below, right? So you'll have to go to the guidelines. There you go. And then follow these instructions, okay? And then you should be able, you should be good to go. So that's actually pretty, pretty nice. All right, um, so that, that's just problem one. So just here, just show a screenshot of like, I got it to work, here I press a button, here's the information. And that's it, You'll, you're done with 3. Point, or with 3.1, and then now you're ready to start 3.2, which is the first task. And you can see that one. Here, this one is uh, extremely easy and trivial, but it it's actually highlights uh, the main idea. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about it. So task number one, posting a malicious message to display an alert window. The objective of this task is to embed a JavaScript program in your ELG profile, such that when another user views your profile, the JavaScript program will be executed and an alert window will be displayed. And so this is the example I've, I've shown in the slides already quite a bit. So the following JavaScript program will display an alert window. And you can see that there. You see that? If you embed the above JavaScript code in your profile, and you know, so, so you got to figure out where it goes, like in the brief description field that you have. And that's why reading the code might be useful to give you more insight into how it's written and where the vulnerabilities might be. Then any user who views your profile will see the alert window. It'll just pop up because it's there. You load the page, it runs that JavaScript that you injected. In this case, the JavaScript code is short enough to be typed into a short field description, right? And that's what you're gonna do. However, if you had longer JavaScript code, there's also an alter alternative for that. If you want to run a long JavaScript segment, let's say, but you are limited by the number of characters you can type in the form, which you might say to yourself, well, you know, this is an easy input validation. Ha ha, just allow strings that aren't bigger than this. Well, they even have, a, the attackers even have a solution for that, which is this, right? So they can do, instead of injecting the entire code, they can just do this. Um, so if you want, to run a longer JavaScript, but you are limited by the number of characters then uh, that you can type in the form, you can basically just store the JavaScript program in a standalone file. You see that? You can save it with a JS extension and then refer to it using the source attribute, okay, in the script tag. And you see the following. So you probably did this in 362, right? Where you, you know, you didn't actually write your JavaScripts in the, in the, in the um, HTML file itself, but instead you had your JavaScript in another file and you just reference it from there. And so that's really, and also in your term project, you also have this button because it's a standard practice. So this is yet another thing that you can do. And the example of how to do that is here. So you basically start um, the script tag. So all of this, all of this is just what this one would have been. And then you have the closing tag over here. Oops. Oops. 
have the closing tag, which is this one, this one, and then this one, which is the code inside, you literally actually don't have anything because it's really just what's in between the two tags. So instead, what happens is that this script tag, just like you do with an IMG tag or something else, is basically expanded. And you can see that here, you plug in, you know, type text, JavaScript, whatever, but really what matters is that you plug this in there, okay? And by plugging that in there, you have now source, and the source references, guess what? Another URL, http example.com. And notice that this is actually www.example.com, which is not at all, XSS lab, lab L. So they don't have the same domain. You see that like in web same origin policy. They don't have the same domain. Uh, so they don't have the same origin and yet you can access. So you're going to have to put this script though in that example.com. Okay. So you're going to have to make it available there and you can see the folder is located here in bar www example underscore two. you should be able to access them, I believe. Um, but there's the explanation for that. All right, so that is problem one. Oh. Here, right, task one. Okay, so uh, you can see that there. So in the above example, the page will fetch the JavaScript program from example.com, which can be any web server. So that's the beauty of it. Because um, it's really the, the, this tag is the one that's just bringing in all that code into the script. So it just works out really well. All right, and that's basically what I want you to start working on. So um, this is a, the first problem that you should start working on right now. And then on Thursday, I will continue with the more complex ones. Okay, so I definitely don't want to get into the, I like, I'll talk about Sammy Worm altogether. So I'm not going to get into that one. I'm also not going to get into this one today, task three. But we can actually talk about task two because task two is very similar to task one. So once you've achieved task one, which is just uh, getting that alert to pop up. So basically you're going to get a pop up that gives you that prints out excess x s s then in task number two which is 3.3 you're really literally all you have to do is repeat that same exercise but now you're going to do something else right so the objective of this task is to embed a javascript just like you did in the previous problem such that when another user views your profile the user's cookie will be displayed in the alert window. Think about that. This can be done by adding some additional code to the JavaScript program in the previous test. So notice that now, instead of doing alert XSS, we do alert document.cookie. So that dome is going to grab for that current document that's currently being used in your browser, because you're the client, right? Um, it's going to grab your cookie and display it as a pop-up on the, as an alert in a pop-up. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. No questions so far, guys? No questions? All this clear? So I, th I think it's actually pretty easy. The thing that's going to make it harder, harder is once we get to task, Four, because here, as you can see, we have to start writing code, right? So we'll have to start writing code. And so that's going to make it a little bit harder, but not too much, to be honest. This, this lab is not difficult, I don't think. All right. And then uh, I guess on stealing cookies from the victim machine and sending it to a server, we'll talk about this. This one's a little bit different. So I think this is a good stopping point. 
Um, and I'll talk about this one on starting Thursday, right? But for, so now you can definitely start doing this, uh, start reading through this lab. Also, if you have any questions about anything else. So uh, let's do this. Let's stop here for today. I'll stay a few minutes uh, in case you guys have any questions about anything, but otherwise I'm going to turn off the recording.